So tonight, our topic is that if we live by the Dhamma, that we can stay well physically and mentally. We can look after ourselves, especially the mental health. And we can have a good sound mind and avoid any mental afflictions. So you might wonder how. Because normally we are very used to fix our problems by going to the psychologist or psychiatrist or to the counsellor then get some medication and in that way to fix the problems. But what the Buddha pointed to us is that if we can look into the cause Then if we can understand what are the causes that are creating a certain result, if you don't like that result, then all we have to do is change the causes that created it. Get rid of them. So Buddha pointed to us that all the mental imbalances, the unhappiness, depression, mental illnesses happens as a result of we not taking care of our mind, not purifying the mind. If we keep this place not cleaning, not purifying, this place will be full of germs, bacteria and virus and fungus and a lot of dirt and rubbish and pollutants. What will happen if we start to live in that environment? We will start to get sick. The same way if we leave these mental pollutions, pollutants in our mind, our mind will start to get sick. So Buddha pointed out, if we purify our mind from all these pollutants, all the germs, if we can get rid of them, a pure mind is very balanced. With that balance, there is tranquility and it will be very happy also. So a healthy mind is very peaceful and very happy. When the mind is full of germs, it's very negative, very gloomy, very dark, very stressed, no peace and no happiness, very unhappy. We have to diagnose the state of our mind. What state is our mind? Then you will know whether we have a healthy mind or an unhealthy mind. After the diagnose, getting it correctly, <laughs> then we can start to treat. No need of a psychiatrist. We can treat. But you need to know how it manifests certain symptoms. So we need to recognize now, so what do we call germs? What is this pollutants? What pollutes the mind? Outwardly we see the bacteria, the virus, the fungus, the, you know, whatever the things that is harmful to us, we have identified. 
but hardly people recognize what is harmful to a healthy mind. What are the germs? So Buddha pointed out the real germ is the ego living with a sense of self, with the self-centered way. This selfishness. Selfishness arises as a result of avijja, which is translated as ignorance. It is due to not knowing exactly what's going on, what we experience, who we are. That we are allowing these germs to develop. As you know from the gene itself, is called the selfish gene. So from the gene code itself, we think here I am, we feel here I am, and we sense this is me, I, me, myself. But if we really investigate, we will find a different thing. It's like when you look at a mirage, you will see there is water. And we, if we don't investigate, we will think there is water. And we will plan to drink and quench our thirst. Some will plan to sell that water. Some will plan to do so many things with that. But whoever plans to do things with this mirage, thinking there is water, all they will get is utter frustration because to begin with, there is no water in that. It's only a look, it's only an illusion there. The same way with this delusion we have, no matter what we try to do to make ourselves happy, this is the human quest, this is what we do. We try to make I and me and myself and just my things to be happy. You can't do it in that selfish way. We are dealing with a delusion. So this is why Buddha says, first investigate who you are. Because it is who I am that is well, that is sick, that gets born, that die. Everything is to do with the capital I. But if we understand the real position of this capital I, like the water in the mirage, whether there is water or not, whether there is a static capital I here, a static thing in here, we can solve the problem. If we investigate, we will find there is a body that we have personalized and taken to be as I, me, myself, here I am. And there is feelings that we have personalized as my feelings. So there, the I, me, the myself. And there is this emotions. And there is this thought. Kaye kaya nupasi vihirati vedana nu vedana nupasi vihirati chitte chitta nupasi vihirati dhamme dhamma nupasi vihirati. Buddha is pointing out, look into these four main things that you have personalized as for what it is. Look into the body as a body. But to us it is I, this is me, this is myself. But Buddha is saying, 
the body is just a body if you look into it from top to the bottom bottom to top in out out in <laughs> you only will find the skin the cells the muscles the organs the blood all that and you know just some things and more you want to go deeper you can go into the four elements you find all these atoms and molecules are bonded in different different ways either it's really really close to each other very hard bonds or loose or it's just not connected at all it's just flowing or there's energy there's activities walking standing sitting sleeping lifting putting down so there is many angles to look at the body as a body and we will see if we contemplate the body as a body you will start to realize oh well where can i locate the eye you can't it's not even seated in the brain so but if we don't really investigate we will be just diluted and we will be always taking this body to be myself but for someone who investigate it pays close attention and look into it they will find a different answer they will see a body the same way if you pay attention to the feelings the emotions the activity in the mind the thoughts same thing you will just find some activities going on when we didn't investigate this clearly properly in that ignorance we have personalized all this and we found i me myself but if you closely investigate you will see the activities for the activity the body for the body so then come to the realization it's called the self realization to realize that non self aspect <laughs> there was only impersonal activities that was going on we have personalized it but what is there is a non self aspect anatta but as long as we keep thinking there is water in the mirage we just take it for that face value we are very far away from the truth and living in that your own mind and planning what to do with the mirage to drink the water and quench the thirst to sell it and earn money to be rich many things it only leads to frustration lonely need to lot of physical mental suffering the same thing is happening to us as long as we are living in this ignorance with such delusion here i am no escape from physical mental suffering but the minute we start to investigate and look into who i am you start to shed this thick sense of self i me myself and selfish ways and self centered ways it will start to dissolve and one fine day you might realize oh okay <laughs> this is what was happening in here it's just like a machine working it was just that i wasn't aware of what was happening here so until we come to that point we will be a slave to our body to our feelings to our emotions to our thinking because we think that is i me myself so the thing about 
I is I like to have, I like pleasurable things. I like pleasant feelings. I don't like unpleasant feelings. So as long as when there is this thick sense of I, we are very busy wanting to get what I like with the desire, the greed arises. Then wanting to get rid of what I don't like. So we react with ill will, with hatred. So we are very busy. Whole life is busy. To get what I like and to get rid of what I don't like because I think that's the way to be happy. But can you drink the water from the mirage and quench your thirst and be happy? No way. Because that water didn't exist at the first place. The same way you cannot make someone happy that who doesn't even exist in here. We will only be chasing it. We will only be pleasing our senses in the body. That is what we are doing. We are busy to please our senses in the body. When the eye says, I want to watch this drama, you go and watch. I want to watch this movie, we go and watch. Yes, we get temporary pleasure from that. The neurons will fire, the thoughts will come, the hormones will come, the emotions will come. We are very busy. It's only that we have been very busy. But the reality is, you will never get a satisfied, good quality, happy feeling by going after this way of trying to find happiness. As long as we have the delusion, we think the way to happiness is by following the sensual pleasures. But in reality, that's not the way. So Buddha said, Kama Sukalli Kanu Yogo is a wrong way, wrong practice. But that is the practice of a lay person. Normally, that is the practice of a lay person. From the morning to night, what you all think is, what should I eat? What should I feed my loved ones? What to cook? What to buy? What to wear to please your eyes, your body? What to buy? Where to go? <laughs> which trip? <laughs> which shopping? To which shopping mall? What should I buy? What should I watch? TV? Movie? In the house? Or go out? Whole day we being very busy pleasing our the senses. That is called the lay life. Why? Because we believe that is the way for me to be happy. So this is what Buddha said, as long as you keep on believing in the wrong things, you will never get to the ultimate truth, to the ultimate happiness. We can live in our la-la land, you know, believe in whatever you want to believe, you can live. This is how we've been living. But that will never deliver us from physical, mental suffering because we are working we are getting busy <laughs> we are tiring ourselves we are stressing ourselves in the pursuit of trying to please i me myself trying to find happiness all we get is stress this is what's happening when the stress means physically you're so tired there's a lot of aches and pains and tension in the body and because when the body is so tired and tensed, your mind is not going to be happy. So the, with the physical body having problems, mind also will grasp that and we will have a lot of discomfort and unhappiness coming as a result of that. 
So when we go down this way, killing our body will make our mind unhappy and we'll never be happy in that way. But you can have 100 million thousand fixed deposit, mansions, maybe Rolls Royce, maybe even a jet. You will have a big family, maybe with a lot of children, a lot of grandchildren, a lot of people together, a lot of money, power, fame, everything. But to the extent that you are being tiring this body, you will be unhappy, you will be very stressed. So more and more you go after this wrong belief that it is this material things, it is this pleasing the senses that can bring happiness and you become busy pursuing them from morning to night, night to morning. We are heading away from happiness and we are getting more and more stressed. And if this stress continues, we haven't done anything to relax the body, to rest the body and correct our views and think in the right way, the stress will develop. So there will come a time when the stress is too much, normally people can get stressed and they can bounce back. But if you continue to live in this way, it will come to a point where you are running on emotions, you are running on all the hormones and the body, the brain itself get addicted to this, your own hormones and the hormones will start to run the show. That's the time we say that we can't control our moods, we can't control our emotions. Slightest thing, they will start to get angry. Slightest thing, they will get fears, anxiety, worries. Slightest thing, they will be very sad, cry. It's out of their control. So it's like a vehicle now has no brakes because we have overused the brakes. Brakes pads are worn out. Hmm. Now the machine itself will run and when we come to this stage, we say, ah, someone is clinically depressed, ah, mentally ill. Because before, where the control was from your thoughts, from your good quality thinking or ability to think rationally, logically and control these emotions, it is in the mind that had the control, but now it's lost. So we say that my mind has no power now, so it's not healthy, sick mind. So when it comes to that point, it brings a lot of suffering. As you know, when you are emotional, that's not comfortable. You have no peace, no happiness, and the body is giving trouble as well. So no way we are going to find happiness by trying to pursue sensual pleasures. So after we come to this stage where we have lost the control over our own emotions, we have no control over our moods, we can't face the world to the slightest thing, we will react with emotions. When it continues a few months, few years, we will have, it, have enough of it. We will try the medicine, the sleeping tablet, the tranquilizers, but there will come a time, you know, you have to keep on increasing the dose and you will have enough of it and you think, ayo, this suffering is enough, I'll hang myself. That's when the suicidal thoughts will come, this is enough, now enough, uh, no happiness, so why should I live? When someone is very unhappy, all they will have is to share also unhappiness. So no matter what they deal with, whoever deal with, conflicts. So no happiness from relationships either. So can't stand each other, whether it's a house, whether it's in the office, wherever. There will come a time, are you? No, this is not nice, this is not pleasant, no point living. 
the suicidal thoughts will come and if the proper attention is not given and managed this stage definitely they will do it one day so today because of our such wrong view that this material things essential pleasures can bring us happiness we are so tired to the point that highest cause of death is suicide so that's where the depression the mental illness the stress will lead to depression it will lead to mental illness it will lead to suicide that's where we are today at the highest cause of death is not covid not cancer not heart problems suicide it is this mental problem that is leading us there if we can end the suffering by suiciding well done we don't need a buddha to come and help us to find liberation you know if we can finish it that way good why bother straight after we are born we can die too why live no need to live at all but the thing is in that way we will only aggravate the problem we will only worsen the problem because how your mind is how disturbed it is when you die at that last moment the last thought how much emotions you will get in that same state of mind you will be born again probably a lot more worse situation because there's more emotions now when you die and with that suffering you will be born again so we haven't solved the problem we only have made it worse because as a human being if we can correct our thinking and we can come to the realizations which we can uh, understand the realities we can live with them because we have a very evolved brain that supports us to understand things but after suicide we don't know what type of a birth we will get depending on the suffering that was going on and in that same state we will get birth normally it says it's it's more in the lower realms you won't even get a human birth so then we will not even have a chance to correct we won't even have a chance to understand why we suffered so much when we go down see even in the animal realm if we are teaching a cat or a dog why they have so much suffering pain why they are so emotional they won't be able to understand it and they won't be able to fix it but we human beings can now that i'm teaching you if you understand you can think and then you also can put it to action and see the results too this is human that's a special thing about the human beings different from animals animals only can they only governed by the emotions they only think from the morning to night how to please their senses what to eat where to go you know how to reproduce how to look after their offspring all emotionally so if the human being is only doing those things there's no difference between the human being and this lower realm beings so what would the pointed out is human being is a very special being because we can understand exactly what's going on so when we understand this we have the power to wake up so buddha is pointing out it is this wrong beliefs misunderstandings not understanding the realities bringing this immense suffering to us so buddha is pointing out it is not pursuing this pleasing your senses that is going to bring the good quality ultimate happiness 
but it is actually renouncing them. It is letting go of this wrong idea and you not being a slave to this body, to these senses, will bring you good quality happiness. How? Because when you realize this body for the body, the eyes are eyes. <laughs> it's not me, it's not me, this is not me, this is not me. More we realize body as a body, more we will stop being a slave to it. So a lot of your projects, a lot of your busyness, we can, you know, calm down. We don't need that much money as what you need now. Because you will have very limited needs. You will have a very simple life. You don't work like a cow from the morning to night, night to the morning to make someone else happy, do you? No. We do it to make ourselves happy, I and me and myself and my people. It is because we personalize this. But if we can correct this, we will not kill ourselves. What we need to do we need to live with a meaning, with a purpose. When we do that, we know to which extent we should be using this body, using these eyes, the ears, the nose, the tongue, the body, and for what? What purpose? When we do that, we can just do some service to the others and whatever they give us in return, we can manage our expenses within that range. And we will have very little needs, few needs, just to eat when you are hungry, just something to eat, just some clothes to wear to cover the private parts and to, you know, cover the bit to be protected from the cold and the heat and the mosquitoes and things like that. And also something to get when we get sick, some medicine or some remedy. And also a little place, like to park the car, you need a small car park, no, we don't need a mansion to park the car, yeah? Like that, to park this, you will just need a small <laughs> hut or a small house. It's enough. So you don't need to get a few million dollar loan <laughs> and try to pay it until you die. Just little house will do. The toilet and a small kitchen and a bedroom and a place just to stay. So then you'll be debt free. <laughs> you won't have a big debt. This is how our ancestors lived. Your grandparents, my grandparents, this is how they lived. They didn't have this much stress levels. They didn't have this depression. They didn't have mental illnesses. We didn't hear suicides. I didn't when I was small. Because they were not believing in this that luxury can bring us happiness, that pleasing the senses can bring us happiness. No. They were leading a life with meaning. And they were only busy to serve others, help others, not to earn money for themselves, not to pay for these loans that is like <laughs> Mount Meru. No. They were very lovingly, kindly, compassionately, very busy to help others, to look after others. But they lived with little. Whatever they had was enough. They didn't pile all this plastic. They didn't, you know, make all these things. No, they were very happy with to eat. They go and get the banana leaf, put the rice in there, eat and throw the banana leaf. It will decompose. No problems. <laughs> What problems have we created now? 
by saying we are developed. <laughs> ah, they were living a very simple life with good sound mind and making good decisions, <laughs> not harming them, not harming others, not harming the environment either. They were not taxing <laughs> so much. But now that we are so far away from the realities, we are so deluded, we are not just killing ourselves, we are not allowing others to live peacefully either, and also we are not allowing the earth to continue <laughs> any life. We are almost coming to an kind of an end if we don't change our attitudes. We haven't found the happiness that we were looking for, so we think now it's a problem on the earth, so we must go and build houses in the mass. Then we might get more happiness there, <laughs> the happiness we didn't get in on earth. So next time maybe Saturn, I don't know which one. But, so this will continue like that. We will kill ourselves and kill others and even the planets <laughs> one by one. <laughs> no happiness. So this is why today the Buddha's teachings are so relevant today. If we can understand what Buddha was saying, he can solve a lot of problems. And we can live a misery-free life. <laughs> because at the moment, you talk to people who have money, who have power, who have wealth, who have, you know, everything. If they have everything and no problem, physically also very healthy, they will say, well, you know, there is something inside me that I'm not happy. There's something lacking. I feel lonely. I feel very sad. <laughs> if it's not to do with getting angry and anxiety and worries and this, that and the other. But if they have everything, they're, they're, they're well off. But you talk to them, they will say, ah, there is something lacking, some empty point. I don't know what it is, but I'm not happy. Yes. Because those things can't make you happy. Happiness is not embedded in them. It's an intrinsic quality in the mind. Happiness only comes with a pure mind. Only if your mind is pure, you get a happy happiness. If your mind is full of germs, it's, it can't produce happiness. It will only bring stress. This is why Buddha pointed out it's very important to come to this realization. What Buddha taught begins with wisdom, with understanding. Understanding the problem. Problem is we are deluded. <laughs> we have created our own world with what we think is right, is what it is. But the actual fact is different. So we need to first realize that and from then onwards we need to start work on heading towards to live in a meaningful way. So then we will be practicing more and more selflessness and one fine day they will 100% will come to the selfless realization that who is this. But it must start with that glimpse of that understanding. There is a problem here. Yes, I'm quite deluded. There is a lot of suffering going on. Why? Because I'm just not in touch with the reality. So Buddha's teaching is we must follow Noble Eightfold Path. So the Noble Eightfold start, Path starts with the right understanding, the right perspective, right 
way of thinking the right way of thinking is first we need to understand what we think and what we pursue and what we busy for morning to night to find the sensual pleasures and please the senses and find happiness from that it's a futile way kama sukalukanu yoga is a failed way for happiness <laughs> that's what buddha pointed out So first we need to get that. Then only, as I pointed out to you, your wanting list will start to come down. Your agendas, your projects will start to one by one by you will start to close. Now tomorrow, if you are thinking, oh, this BMW is now good, not good enough. It's been there for a few years. I must go and get the upgraded one. <laughs> If you listen to this properly, you will know why you are not satisfied with this car. When hundred thousand people wanting this, and you have it, and you're not happy, and you want something else to be happy. And even when you are in the BMW, when you are in traffic, if you are happy, you should be very happy. More the traffic, more you can stay inside. More people will see you. There will be more time. You shouldn't get angry at all. You shouldn't get upset at all. You should be thinking, "Yes, yeah, see my car." But if the BMW bought the happiness while you are inside it, <laughs> you shouldn't be unhappy at all. But what happens? <laughs> We don't get happy <laughs> happiness while you are in the. Car in that way. So this is why now, now that car has failed to deliver the happiness. You think by upgrading it tomorrow, I can be happy. But that's going to fail soon too. So this is what's happening. So this is why this understanding will ground us. It will help us to sort things out. What we need is a vehicle to get. To from point A to point B, as long as it's safe, it will be okay. I don't need to pay hundred thousand million dollars and have a loan in the bank and pay maybe ten times as the price of that car over a period of time and have to work like a slave just to pay that off. But if the Toyota can do the same thing, well, that's good enough. When you don't have that burden of that loan, that will be giving you some lightness in the mind and the heart, and less work. Less work for the body, more rest, more relaxation, and you will have more time to serve others, do things for the others. Because it is a selfless way of thinking, working that is going to bring more and more happiness. More and more, we think about I and me and myself and just my family and my loved ones. Stress cycle starts. So this is the thing. So when people get this point correct. That kāmati jāyati soko, kāmati jāyati bhaya. What Buddha is saying, it is this going after the kāma, going after the pleasing the senses that brings all the emotions, all the mental, physical, mental suffering. But we have not paid attention to it. And you might ask now. To the level we are so addicted just to live for the sake of the body to make the body happy, your eyes, the ears, the nose, the tongue, the body. That's why you go to work. The body asked for a big mansion. You said yes, okay. You went and got the loan and built the house. And until you die, until you sixty, you can't even retire because there's a huge loan. Why? Because the body said, "I need it." So we did it, but if we come to these realizations, what is real? 
what is not real, what we have made up in the mind, life becomes very easy. We will start to live with meaning. You will find a purpose to live then. Okay, if this body is not I or me or myself, under that delusion, we saw it like that. In the mirror, it, it looks like, it appears there is water. But only when you investigate, you find no water to begin with. The same way here, you feel there is, here I am. But only when you investigate all the things that you have personalized as I, me, myself, you will come to the conclusion, oh, there was only some impersonal activities that was going on. There is only a body. You will realize that. But you need to do your exercise properly. Then, after you come to that realization, where you are going to live is going to be different. Now, renouncing doesn't mean you have to be like straight away, be like a monk or a nun. They have realized this. That's why they have given it up, killing themselves <laughs> in pursuit of finding pleasure. They have given it up. So they have settled into, you know, a robe. And if they are hungry, they can go and beg for food or you are you you are very loving caring you bring the food to them and they'll be very happy with what you bring that's enough if they get sick someone look after them yes that's enough and if there is a place to stay you know whether it's in the street or under a tree or someone has offered a five-star hotel or someone has offered whatever oh, that's good enough because they have understood now, it's not these physical, material things that is going to bring them happiness. Happiness comes from keeping the mind pure. A selfish mind, egoistic mind, very thick sense of I, me, myself, can't have happiness. That's the thing. So when the mind is pure, means coming into realizations and lessening this ego and getting rid of the selfishness and living the self-centered way, that will bring a lot of happiness. This is what the Noble Eightfold Path will do. This is what we are supposed to practice in our life. Practice of selflessness. That is what's called Perfecting the paramitas, the ten perfections, dasa paramita. Dasa paramitas are the ones that will help us to get rid of the ego, the sense of the self, and become selfless. So one of the one of the dasa paramita is the sila paramita. What you observe now, starting with five precepts. Correct. Dana paramita, sila paramita. So these paramitas are to purify ourselves from this greed, hatred, and most problem is a delusion. If the delusion is removed, greed and hatred is not a problem, it's gone too. We need to tackle this delusional problem. So this sila paramita means why we observe this sila, the precepts, is actually we want to come to that realization, the selfless realization, to come to that. Until we come to that selflessness, to that state of the realizing non-self, until that we are going to behave in such a way, not in a selfish way. But the gene itself will direct to selfish behavior. Because Jean is interested in I and me and myself and me continuing. If I can't, I will pass the gene and the progeny will continue. That's what the gene is interested about, survival. 
but this that will go with suffering <laughs> will go with a lot of stress physical mental stress this continuation part of it is the physical mental suffering so if you're interested in freeing yourself from physical mental suffering the stress then put the pointed out you're suffering due to this delusion that's why you're continuing this because there is a I. But when you realize, to begin with, there was no water in the mirage, the same way to begin with, there is no such thick sense of some valuable static thing as an I to be hold on to. What is there is a body, the feelings, the emotions, the thoughts, the, all these things going on. Together, because we didn't see, we took it as I, me, and myself. So if we can come to that realization, the problem will be solved, no suffering. Now again, you might ask how? In our body, there is two systems that take messages to the brain in the nervous system called sympathetic and parasympathetic. Any thought to do with I, me, myself, any self-concern thoughts go in the sympathetic and sympathetic activates the self-survival cycle, flight or flight reaction. That is called stress cycle. That is called stress, the anger, the fear, the anxiety, the worries, the sadness, all the emotions are happening as a result of we being self-centered, thinking with the self. So there is another system in the body called the parasympathetic. When we think thoughts that got nothing to do with self-interest, there's nothing to do with I, me and myself, those messages are taken by the parasympathetic and the parasympathetic is connected to pineal gland. When the pineal gland is stimulated, you get hormones that totally relaxes you and brings peace, calmness, and happiness to the mind. But the sympathetic is connected to the amygdala that really stresses us, sends the stress hormones. So this is how the system separates the selfish and the selfless thoughts. So it's a thought that is controlling. So until we come to the realization about the this non-self business, at least we must behave not in a selfish way, but considering others' welfare and well-being is very important as, same as mine. That is what this sealer is about. We giving importance to others welfare and well-being and we not giving any suffering to others. Whether it's intentionally or unintentionally, directly or indirectly, we will not stress pass, we will not destroy, we will not do things that will hurt others, harm others, stress others. So we are not going to observe the five precepts because you want to go to heaven or you are afraid to go to hell <laughs> or because you want to show you are a good person or because Buddha asked you to do so. That's why I said this path starts from wisdom. So we need to know where we are heading, why we are doing this. Everything we do has to help these paramis to get to that selfless realization. So that, that this sila paramita is there for us to get to that. So we are not selfishly keeping it because I want to have a good life. I want to have good merits to go to heaven or to, you know. The sila is that you give importance to others, others' life, others' belongings, the honesty, the relationships, and everything. How you see them is important to you. You do the same for the others. We will not 
hurt, harm, give any stress to anybody. So then we won't have any arguments about whether we should do this or not because it's already being done by someone or I only bought it, <laughs> like that. If your concern is out of love, kindness, compassion, understanding others' suffering, the questions won't arise whether with intention or with no intention, whether it was directly or indirectly. If some hurt or harm or some cruelty or some damaging thing has happened, whether you had the intention to do it or not, if it has happened, it has happened, the damage has happened. So this is why the understanding is the first thing. So Buddha is pointing out, when we are purifying ourselves, our mind itself will start to talk. So Buddha is saying, if you want to live a pure life, you make sure you don't do these five things to support your life or to support your loved ones because this will bring immense suffering to everyone who is involved and everyone who is in the influential range. Please do not uh, try to earn money from these five trades, no, if some one who don't have a good sound brain, who don't have loving kindness, compassion, if they engage in these five trades, please don't support, please don't sponsor, please don't buy products. What are these five? The slave trading. Anything that involves slavery. Anything that involves killing fish, animals, so the meat industry, that cruel industry, anything that produces weapons, anything that is dealing with alcohol, liquor, cigarette, drugs, anything that is dealing with poison. So Buddha is saying these five trades, you can easily earn money but it's very damaging. It will bring a lot of hurt, harm, suffering, damage to many, many living beings, including the environment and the Mother Earth. You will see how true it is. We may not be having in that having a factory or, or, or killing the animals or producing the weapons and things, we may not do that to find our living because we understand it's wrong. But if someone else who don't understand this as a wrong thing because they believe it's okay because everything is being created for them and it's okay to use anything and everything for my happiness, it's my right, if something, someone is so deluded in that way and with no love, with no kindness, with no compassion, if they engage in these trades, the people who understand the path to purity, people who understand living with goodness and wisdom is the way to be free from suffering, must not engage in supporting this. Because more we support this cruel industries, the industries that is damaging, more we will lose the peace, the harmony on earth, the environment will be gone, the animals will be gone, the human beings will suffer. This will only lead to suffering for everyone. So this is why I said we need to understand whether we do something directly or indirectly or with in intention or unintentionally. E while we are doing something, supporting something, even unconsciously, if the damage is done, damage is done. 
after that it's very difficult this is what's happening even with the buddhist because we are not realizing why we are keeping the precepts the aim is to give up the selfish way of living the life we are to broaden our heart we are to think about others welfare and well-being is important as mine others life the right to live is important as mine we have to look after each other we have to love each other we have to you know treat each other compassionately so keeping precepts is not easy because it has to come from the understanding and if it comes from the understanding then it's the understanding will guide you oh don't do this don't do that don't support this be away from that you know today we are the most developed we say we have the highest technology we have highest this that and the other and everything all the good food you have access to the best medical systems best medicines that we have ever known best surgery procedures best education everything is the best now but do you know without any of these best best your and my ancestors our grandparents lived up to 120 years of age their life span the maximum life was 120 years they had a good healthy life until the last minutes the last days they were doing their own thing and they died peacefully they actually lived a good life than us without any best <laughs> things available they may have had only one hospital in the whole country or in that whole state or in that whole city they didn't have psychiatrists they didn't have psychologists they didn't have counseling they didn't have depression they didn't have mental illnesses they didn't hear about a suicide they lived a good quality physically mentally good healthy life and very stress free very happy life why because they were not about themselves the whole attitude was your success is my success so they had a more pure mind than us but today what we have done we have become very selfish more and more selfish only think about i and me and myself and only my family or my loved ones the rest who cares we have the best but our life expectancy now the the average life span for human being for our generation is 60 hardly someone will live for 120 hardly someone will reach 100 even if they reach 70 80 90 80% in australia have dementia they have lost their mind they have lost their mind when they reach the 70 80 90 that your generation will reach there some will but even though they reach there the humanness is almost gone because they don't know who they are what their name is who they who come to visit them whether they have eaten or not whether they are wearing a cloth or not whether they are in the house or walking in the street thinking it's a lounge room I don't know so our age population now 80% is in a locked age care unit because the doors has to be locked no not much difference between the prison and that <laughs> because you can't have the doors open because they will walk in the street thinking it's a house we have lost it thanks to all the good things and the best things so at the at at their age who is reaching 70 80 90 they didn't have the best best you should watch un- until how this this generation 
younger generation, when they come to 20, 30, 40, where they will end up? They will need a young locked units. That is age care no locked units now. They will need young <laughs> people's locked units because they will lose it by 2030. For the amount of time they spend on the TV, on the games, on the pornography, on this, that and the other, amount of damage it will do to them. It's going to be very fast and progressive. So what we will have is less physical health, less strength, less mental health, less life um, force. So we will have more and more young, young, young deaths. And that's happening in Melbourne. We have like every week we have a young person's death in Melbourne, one of the best countries on earth. Everyone likes to go to Australia. A lot of the times the best city in the world, most livable city in the world. That means most livable city on earth means after that it will be the heaven. <laughs> most livable city means that. That's where the most livable good conditions are there for someone to live happily. In Australia, somewhere, whether it's Melbourne or Sydney or Perth or Adelaide or somewhere, I don't know where, but it's, a lot of the times it's that in that country somewhere. So that means after that, what is best will be the heaven. But in that country, the older generation who are reaching now 70, 80, 90 is in, most of them, 80% is in locked units because of the dementia. And the young generation is now facing a big problem. They can't study, they can't do assignments because they only can play games. <laughs> and now they have to start building the rehabilitation centers for the young. And they can't remember, they can't do any calculations without a calculator, they can't do anything with the, without a computer. And all, already they, a lot of them are sick. So with this advancement, what we have got is a lot of hospitals, a lot of doctors, a lot of nurses, and you go around, you will see a pharmacy. <laughs> Every corner you will see a pharmacy, you will see a clinic. If you remember when you were small, you only had one pharmacy for the whole village, one hospital for the whole town, few doctors. Now everywhere, every country wants doctors, so where on earth we are going to bring them? And now in Melbourne, we have mental hospitals, but now there is no space in the mental hospital, so every base hospital has a mental unit. If you look into the Buddhist countries that was fed with Buddhism in Sri Lanka, we didn't have any mental hospitals. Only after the Westerners went and spread their way of thinking, we started to have one mental hospital, and that was also empty until recently. Now we have visitors coming and going. But still, it's under control, not as to the level of Western countries. We still don't have that much stress levels, but very soon, if they follow blindly, very soon, I guess if you hear, if they follow blindly, they will get it too. But at the moment, Burma is doing well, because Burma was not under a colony. They are still purely practicing influence with Buddhism. They live by Buddha, this Dhamma. So the most happy people on earth are in Burma. But they, they don't have this all these advanced things that we talked about. They don't have. They still have their easy way of life, simple way of life, little things, be happy with few things, being contented. But the happy people, no stress. The stress levels are very low in, um, sorry, Bhutan. Bhutan. I got the name wrong, sorry, yeah? Bhutan. Mm in Bhutan. So this proves, you know, the, it is in the mind that the happiness, not in this outwardly things of pleasing your senses. So keeping your precepts is to help you to 
come to this realization. So it is not to be practiced selfishly. So if you really want to progress in this path, practice your precepts or protect your precepts with that understanding. I must always consider others' lives, the chicken, the cow, the little ant, the cockroach that come and visit you, whether you like or not. <laughs> they also have the right to live here and some of them have been on earth before us. We are quite late in the evolution. <laughs> They're here before us, and it's thanks to them that we are here because they also do their job without the insects. The rubbish will compile, you know, they decompose. That's why we can put our feet on the ground. So everyone has a role to play. So we have to take care of each other. If you don't like something, then you go and put it out. That's a different story. But don't ever kill or destroy, directly or indirectly with intention or without intention. Because you might say, ah, no, 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 I didn't have the intention, ah, blah. But if the damage is being done, the damage is being done. How would you like if someone don't kill you directly, but they pay someone else and then go and buy your flesh there and go and eat it tonight? <laughs> we don't like. Then don't do it to another living being. <laughs> Have compassion, have loving kindness. This path is with wisdom. With wisdom will come the unconditional love, the kindness, the compassion, all that. Because it, it is not something that you can sit here and say, may all beings be well and happy, well and happy, and you go and live the way you want in a very selfish way. True loving kindness, you don't even have to practice that way. If you have the wisdom, it'll come. And it's a way you have to live 24 hours, 365 days until you die. You see? So we have actually got a lot of things, not in the right context. <laughs> we have created short methods and also to make our selfish being happy and we still continue to be selfish and feed the selfishness and we live the way we want. If that becomes Buddhism, if that is the Buddha's teaching, if we take it like that, no salvation for us. No way we will be free from suffering. No way we will be free from any physical, mental suffering. So we really need to understand what Buddha taught. You have to start understanding the end result and then working towards that. So the, the place where you put your feet is on the precepts. That is your foundation. Not think that I'm the most important one and I, I can have anything and everything at the expense of <laughs> everyone else. No. I'm also just part of little speck in this ecosystem. Everyone has to live here, be here. My duty is just to, while I'm here on earth for a short period of time, everyone else also should be here. They also should have a good life, a happy, comfortable experience. So we all have to look after each other. So with that understanding that we have to practice the five precepts, it's called Atupa Nayaka Dhamma Pariyaya Padanam, putting yourself in other's shoes, making sure that how important is your life to you, you see that in others' life, how important that life is to them. So don't destroy directly or indirectly, or do, uh, intentionally or unintentionally. It's not about looking after my karma. Huh. This is not to be selfishly looking after my karma. This is to look after each other. Ah, ah. So when we practice that way, 
that selflessness will start to develop because every time before you think before you say something before you do something check is this selfish is this self-centered am i taking others into account am i thinking of others welfare and well-being how it's affected what can i do to help to improve how can i stop their stress the suffering from this decision from the way i speak from the way i do things ah this needs to be checked that is living a virtuous life with universal benevolence the metta is called universal benevolence not just having a narrow mind about the welfare and well-being of i and me and myself and only just my child and my grandchild and just my loved ones that is not universal benevolence that's selfish love <laughs> but universal benevolence means you expand your mind and your heart from that narrow point to a broader one and include everyone's welfare and well-being in that and we wish may all beings be well comfortable be protected may no harm happen may they be no not in danger may all beings be well and happy so it can't be just a thought in your head and go and do the opposite <laughs> it has to manifest in your speech and action too yes so start from there and practice the selflessness and continue to develop the understanding listen to more dhamma listen to the sutras read the sutras it's all directed to get to that point to realize that what we thought as i me myself is an experience and the nature of that experience is anicca dukkha anatta there is no static thing to be find here as a very important thing to find here as this person or this me i so in order to get there we need to follow the noble eightfold path but it starts from wisdom developing maybe to level 1 when you finish the noble eightfold path when you come to the samma samadhi that means like the pragna or the wisdom is like perfect maybe if it's 10 out of 10 that is 10 so we start from like say one means the sam samya drushti means you getting this right understanding so it is with this right understanding with this wisdom we start the journey wanting to come to the real realizations wanting to know the truth wanting to know as they are because at the moment we are living thinking there is water in the mirage we are thinking there is this very important one i am the center of the universe everyone should serve me everyone should give me everyone should listen to me and if i like something i can eat it even if a life been sacrificed who cares doesn't matter i can satisfy my tongue and let them continue to do that cruel thing who cares <laughs> it all comes from this static thinking of have wanting to make this one happy so more we continue in that way more only more stress will come so if we call this the advancement developing more and more greed and hatred and delusion and that is our education only stress only physical mental illnesses will rise and we will have to have a hospital in each corner too now only the pharmacy but very soon we will need a hospitals in every corner too because all we will have to do is treat each other to get well <laughs> because we are creating all the causes and conditions for stress but as i said our ancestors lived for an up to 120 with good physical health good mental health 
because they were living a meaningful life, a purposeful life, with a lot of love, kindness, compassion directed towards everyone, and it was everyone's success was their own success. They were not after money. They were not after just pleasing the senses. So they were healthy, yeah, because they were practicing selflessness. So this is what Buddha was pointing out. This is the meditation. Meditation is for us to relax and to rest and to contemplate. We take special time. But first you need to understand. It is with the understanding that you start to then practice 24 hours in all postures, keeping this. Understanding. Yeah, it is the understanding that will direct us into the right direction. Otherwise, there is this four Brahma Viharas, Metta, Karuna, Mudita, Upekka. But now you only know how to practice loving kindness, sitting in a chair and say, may all beings live, be well and happy, and you go and do what you want to do. <laughs> but why you are not practicing the compassion? Why you are not practicing Mudita in that way? Why you are not practicing Upekka in that way? Why only loving kindness? If it can be developed in that way, sitting in the cushion and doing it. Why only one when there is four? Ah. <laughs> this is where we gone wrong. This unconditional loving kindness, compassion, this altruistic joy, this equanimity, they are states of mind. It's a state of mind, it's a quality in the mind. And that comes from when you develop your mind, more and more the selfishness is gone, more and more you are loving, more and more you are kind, more and more you are very friendly towards all beings. You have universal benevolence. And it will come to practice in compassion, wanting to elevate others' suffering, rejoicing in others' success, and being able to have an equanimous mind in the midst of all vicissitudes, you will not jump up and down with emotions. You will be facing it with peace, tranquility, and finding the answers with wisdom, and live. So it's, it's a meditation that we have to practice throughout, 24 hours until we die. Until you get enlightened from that, it will be very natural and it will come normally. But until that, we need to live consciously. You have to have checks all the time. You have to, you know, consciously be. That it will come to autopilot if, after you get enlightened. When you are arahat, it will go on the autopilot. At the moment, what is in your autopilot? The selfish gene <laughs> taking you into this selfish way of living. Ah, got it? Okay. So if you have any questions, you can ask. Okay. Let us say sadhu three times to Venerable. Sadhu, sadhu, sadhu. Thank you very much, Venerable, for the very insightful talk, um, providing us a, our daily dose of wisdom to cultivate insight into the true nature of all conditioned phenomena. Mm. So if, uh, brothers and sisters, you have any questions, please raise your hand and I'll bring the microphone to you. I yes, think we so can our, have about Our two, final three goal is to yeah. get enlightened. So enlightenment is not something on another planet where you achieve after you die. <laughs> it's something you realize here and now. This selfishness is the problem, but I better realize what is this self how to, you know, come to this realization. That is the enlightenment. Hmm? Yes. I hope all of us one day will experientially be able to verify. Yes. That. Okay. Any questions? So if you have questions, please ask. Yeah, okay. Thanks. Sukiyoto Bante. Um, actually, I'm looking from the other end. Uh, from what uh, Venerable has uh, shared with us, it's more on, I'm looking from the angle of serving, yes. especially you know, as a mother, as a wife, as a daughter-in-law and kind of thing. Yes. So sometimes the mind will be questioning ourselves yes. uh, after serving them and all that. 
uh, are they seeing what I see or are they seeing, uh, they understand why am I doing something like that? Mm. Is that a selfishness on me or is it setting expectation? Um, while you're doing things to the others. Serving, serving. Yes. Yeah. So you're questioning about the service or when you see others' qualities, you're questioning it or you're questioning about the service? The service. Uh, Are they seeing what I'm seeing? Is that a selfishness element in me or is it uh, I'm setting expectation? Because expectation of? Uh, what uh, I'm expecting them to see, what uh, to kind of the word evaluate me in a uh -huh. sense. Huh? Right, right, right. Okay, now I got it. <laughs> uh -huh. Yeah, no, see, if we start our journey with this understanding that I am to progress towards a selfless path. Uh -huh. So, whatever I do is to get there. So, even the service is then, it's an opportunity that I have got to lose my comfort, to lose my luxury things, lose my things, but to attend to others, to give others, to share others what I have. So, when we do that, on the moment we'll make decisions, oh, they need this, they need that, there's a problem, I must go and attend, I must help. So, we are dedicated for others' welfare and well-being. So, when we do that from that genuine heart, then whether they are going to say thank you to or not, oh, you are so hard working, oh, thank you, whether that comes or the criticism comes, it won't matter to you. So you have attended because you saw a need that was there that needs to be improved or solved or they need that help. So we have done it. That's it. After that, see you, bye-bye, I'm gone. <laughs> Oh. So, whether they criticize you or whether they blame you or whether they praise you, it will not affect you at all because we didn't do it for that. But as normal human beings, there is this sense of self there. So, we actually do normally things what makes us happy. This is why there are so many conflicts between the husband and the wife, the children and the parents. Because we want to do what I think is right, <laughs> what I want, what is going to make me happy. Oh. So a lot of the time, that's not what the other one wanted. <laughs> See? So yeah. the conflict. But when we go into this selfless way, we understand what they want, what needs to be done. Because it's not coming from ego, we will see exactly what needs to be done right now. Okay. It's an ego that blinds us. Whenever you consider as ego? So you need to understand the purpose or the intention that was behind what we call service. So whether we are doing, there is so many people today running around in organizations in these um, charitable things. A lot of the temples, a lot of the spiritual organizations, because a lot of them are run by volunteers. Today, a lot of these places have got a lot of problems. Why? Because it's the ego that's running around, <laughs> not genuine hearts that is helping. You may have experienced that in your organization, in the committees, among the volunteers, a lot of the temples, the churches, these places are experiencing it. Yeah. Yeah. Because it's an ego that is being in display. Okay. Uh, Venerable, uh, on the, as a worldly, as a mother, yes. we are trying to tell the child, mm. this is my point. Mm. Is that something that, no, I'm detecting the, my reason why I, uh, that should be the way kind of thing? Or, I, or am I sharing that that is my thought, my, my opinion? I don't know. Do no, kids... no, as a parent, we have a duty to help them to open their eyes, to teach them what is good, what is bad, what is right, what is wrong, what is selfish behavior, 
the value in giving up the selfishness and becoming a selfless being. We can live like animals. We can live like ghosts. We can live like a normal human being. Or you can live like a little bit better human being, or you can practice and become a great human being. There have been great beings on earth. The perfected, best, great, out of great beings, the greatest was the Buddha. Then you see other great masters also, like Jesus, like Mahatma Gandhi, like Mother Teresa. You know, why the people have called these beings great people? Because they have shown that selfless way of living and helping many and living their life for the sake of others' welfare and well-being. Yeah? More that it was showed, more they being recognized, they are very great. So we have to show our children there is many ways of living as a human being, either as an animal or like a ghost. We can live like that. That's what you see in the today in the news and the TV and the newspaper and everywhere. People are doing things that is not worth for a human being to do. They are behaving in non-human way. Why? Because these things have not been taught. We share our DNA with animals. There's not much difference between ours and the chimpanzees in our DNA. So, naturally, if we don't allow this to control this, we will behave like a monkey. <laughs> so, the monkey will teach the monkey baby how to do monkey things and live like a monkey. So, our human parents, they go to tuition, take their children to tuition, I don't know at the end what they produce. <laughs> They can do it without tuition and make sure that offspring will behave like them. <laughs> we have not been able to teach our children how to be a good human being, how to be a great human being. <laughs> you see, if they took tuition for that, I'll be very happy, but no one takes <laughs> tuition for that anyway. And they even haven't taught that. They have given birth, but we have non-human beings <laughs> among the human. <laughs> so, as a parent, we have a duty to show them how to be a human being and show the scale and teach them, if possible, reach there to become a great human being. You will be a mother for a great human being then. <laughs> you can be the happiest. <laughs> you see, so we have a duty. So do that duty. Um, so that doesn't come from ego, that is showing what needs to be done, how to make use of this humanness to the maximum potential. We are helping them to advance in their evolution. You see? Thank you. <laughs> Thank you. I think we can take one more question. Venerable, uh, I'm very grateful for your sharing tonight, especially on the five precepts. We are Sunday school teachers, and last Sunday, I was sharing five precepts, the first two precepts with 12 years old. Then one of the kids asked me a question. I was saying, look, you and me, we only need to keep the five precepts, you know, no kill, no lie, no steal. But the monks, 227, the nuns, 300 over. Then one girl put up the hand and said, why nuns got more than the monks? So can Venerable please explain, because the next class, next month, I got to continue the last three precepts. So I'm doing my investigation, you know? Thank you. Yeah, now see, when we practice the selflessness, up to a certain point, you can be among the selfish people, which we call lay people, are governed by their own interest. So, one fine day, if you don't have that interest anymore for your life or to your family or to your 
clan, they will say, you are a mad person, no use to us. <laughs> so either you will be looked up as a mad person, or you have to realize what's going on, and then leave them <laughs> and practice the selflessness with the people who are practicing the selflessness. That's when we will have that change. Crack will be changed from selfishness because it doesn't suit us anymore. We don't want to have that restricted, narrow mind. We want to expand it. We want to embrace all beings. You can't do it just when you have, when you are very, you know, embracing only few. So you give up all that, and and then when you leave that, the whole world is your child. All the children are your children. All the parents are your parents, because now you are free. No boundaries. No special love. Everyone's suffering, you understand. Everyone's life importance, you understand. So you start to treat everyone with loving kindness, compassion. So you have a very free heart now, you can serve freely. So now, you have done that transition. So as long as you're remaining with your clan, you're supposed to behave in a way, if you want to be with them. So you have to work still for your and your family benefit. You can't just not do anything. So you do that, but at least you must not hurt, harm any other living being in the process of you trying to look after I and me and myself and just my little family and my loved ones. That is keeping the five precepts. So you're giving freedom for others to live happily. Okay? Now, now that you see the problem in that way of living, never you can, you know, make your just a little beings happy all the time. More we are attached and more we get blinded by that, more damage we will do to the others. So that's the time you will give up. Give that way of living with a narrow mind and doing silly, stupid things just to protect little few. few and do a lot of damage even to the environment and to the earth. So when you realize that, you just give that up and you come to this track. But still, until you come to that 100% realization, you still have the selfish streak. So you, here and there, even when they have come to this side, they have been doing some selfish things. So then when Buddha sees that, it gets reported to the Buddha, at the beginning, for until about 20 years in the sasana, the people who came to the robes were came with understanding. I told you, everything starts with understanding. So when they came to the robes, it was because they understood the importance of this practice, giving up the selfishness and how hard it is to give up while living as a lay person. So they gave that up and they want to practice selflessness in the full way, the express way. So they came, so they were very good in their conduct and virtues and everything. They had their aim to go. But later, from the selfish group again, they saw, ah, if I go there, they get free food, they get free lodging, they get all the things from the king and the merchants, so they being get looked after very well. Ah, I can have a good life in there. So with the selfish attitude, they came here and they started to live in the selfish way. So they started to do selfish things. So then Buddha was, when Buddha saw that straight away, he will say, hey, don't do that, behave yourself. That is Vinaya. <laughs> so when someone does something wrong, Buddha will say, don't do that. Or when someone that needs to be something done, they don't do it lazily, the service or something, Buddha said, no, you must do it. So like this, one by one, one by one, when the occasion arose, they came. So the monk's order was started first. <clears throat> so by the time when the bhikkhunis or the ladies went forth and um, started it, already the monks already had so many rules. So by the time when the bhikkhunis came to the sasana, they already inherited that set what was already being um, put for the monks. Okay. So that set already came to this side. Okay. 
and also these uh, ladies also have their you know the men are from mars the women are from venus, venus. <laughs> they, they have different strength physically mentally it's totally different <laughs> and uh, women are women have more emotions they are more governed by the emotions and more impulsive because they from the dna they are they made to be selfish if you are if they are not they will just leave the give birth to the child oh you gave me so much pain they will walk away <laughs> so they are very much into this you know protecting and attachment and that love is very selfish love just for my child not to the neighbors <laughs> not to the one out there but my one so from the dna that is there more stronger the defilements so when they also came some saw this and they worked hard and they got enlightened but some again like at the beginning after 20 years that that same thing with the monks repeated in this side as well some people just came to easy life so they were just displaying all these selfish emotional behaviors so then when they did something if the monks didn't do because it is more to do with the, especially this women quality, Buddha didn't have to say to a monk to not to do that. <laughs> it's something to do specifically to do with women. So women had more. So monks have um, two, 227. 27. So uh, when you minus 227 from 311, mm -hmm. how many? It's about. 60, 70, 80? I don't know, my mathematics is not good. <laughs> if you, uh, 84. So there is 84 new things because this is to do with the nuns' behaviors. Mm -hmm. So they got them. They inherited that extra set. <laughs> so that was a bit more. That's all. So it shows, you know, the women have more emotions and they have more behavioral things with that. And one of the rules that uh, we have is, you know, from a higher balcony, <laughs> they threw something and someone was walking down there <laughs> and they got <laughs> that uh, dirty water. See, we didn't look at it. So then Buddha said, don't do that. So it's in Vina. So like that. <laughs> Thank you. Better about you have one last question. Okay. Thank sure, you. sure. Maybe a shot. <laughs> yes, better to clarify things than after I leave, not to criticize or to go to go, ah, how come Venerable said this, everyone said that, then you know, if you have a question, ask me. <laughs> yes, uh, Venerable, Aye, uh, good evening, Namo Buddha here. Ah, Namo Buddha, can I correct you one thing again? Before even you start, because I've been taking the opportunity to do it because in Pali, the highest form of respect that you can give to a man, to a monk, with the gender, if it's male, is bante. And to the female, the highest form of respect you can give is arye. Arya. Because in our Sinhala language, in Sinhala, we have Pali words in our language, incorporated in our language, and we use it with the same meaning. So our first lady is called Arya. Arya. The highest form of respect you can give to a female. Now, in Pali, there is no such word as Aye or Aya. <laughs> that has come from when the westerners try to translate this into english they put that and they started they can't roll their tongue there is no <laughs> there is no words are are or, or they don't they are not used to do that 
So they started calling Aya. Aya came, ah, Aya, 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 or Aya, Aya. <laughs> but it doesn't convey the meaning. So if you really want to call them with that respect, you can, because Bahasa Malaysia, Malay, you have Arya. What is the meaning of Arya? Huh? Noble. Noble. There you go. It's noble lady. Yes. So if you can't roll your tongue and call, pronounce it properly <laughs> and address Arya, you can say venerable. Venerable is like for a monk or a nun, doesn't matter. It's a title. That respectable way of calling the doctor. Female, male, doesn't matter. Doctor. <laughs> the same way, venerable. But if you want to use specifically Bhante, Bhante. Arya, Arya. Yes? So it's, it's being written, A-double-Y-A-O, A-R-Y-A-O, or A-I-A, whatever. The Westerners did that with so many other mistakes. This is one mistake. But they have done their best with their knowledge. But whatever the spellings it is, try to pronounce it, Arya. Yes, so you can correct others also. That is how it's in the Pali. If you check... Chulla Veda La Sutta, Visaka, he is calling his former wife, Venerable Dhammadinna Mahatevi, Arye. He is asking questions from Venerable Dhammadinna, always saying Arye, Arye. It is this Arye that's being <laughs> diluted to. Aya is like in, in it's like servant. Aya is like brother. So useless, meaningless words <laughs> being used to call the noble lady. <laughs> so I think it's time that we correct them instead of carrying them blindly, which has no meaning. Okay, thank you giving me for the opportunity. Yes, thank you, thank you. So <laughs> the, the correct word is Venerable Arye. Like either venerable Arie. or Arye or you Arie. do both, I don't mind. <laughs> <laughs> Thank you. Thank you, Arye. So, uh, I've, I've read also, I mean, in addition to this sister's uh, question on the bhikkhuni rules, I've, re I've read also that some rules in the Vinaya are also for the protection of the bhikkhunis. Yes. Okay. Right. So, actually, that wasn't my question. So, my question is, uh, Arye, you mentioned in your talk, uh, thank you for the very powerful talk, by the way. Uh, you mentioned in your talk about how the young people of this, of this day, of this age, uh, their minds are being uh, damaged a lot through uh, the, you, you mentioned through the, the video games, the movies, the pornography and entertainment and so on and so on. What I wanted to say is that there are a lot of big companies that are putting a lot of money into like making sure the young people get addicted to all these things. They, they, they look at the psychology of marketing. They look at how to get our attention hooked on all these things, right? All the entertainment, movies, and so on. So, like, um, the young people of these days, they are facing massive, massive forces. Uh, the odds are against them, so to speak. The odds are against them. They're, they're facing something much more powerful than, than they, could, they could handle. So, like, uh, my question is, is there any hope for our young people today? <laughs> Yes, that is. First, the ch parents have to get enlightened. The <laughs> teachers have to get enlightened, at least to some extent, to the realities. And we should be able to teach them what is good for them, what is bad for them, what they should entertain, what they shouldn't entertain. You know, when I was little, uh, the TV came, but my mum never bought it. She's one of the richest, but she never bought a TV to our house. So when I go to school, my friends will talk about Robin Hood, this, that, cricket. I have no idea. <laughs> and um, my mom would continue to refer. She says, you don't need all the junk and the gossip that what's happening in the world. <laughs> it's your time. This period is for you to study. 
new focus on studies and she would buy the magazines that is to do with the children and their studies you know the children newspaper the children's uh, we had something like that yes magazines and all that that she will buy and that's all she i would you know those days i thought why my mom is doing that but now i look back you know i see that she has done the right thing and when i was school my memory was sharp to the level i i i didn't study much like when i go home i'll do the homework because i have to but i was not someone who will sit and study just uh, i was meditating by then i had a teacher anyway but i would play and uh, you know spend time and when the exam comes just one or two days before I'll just go through it and that's it but when I go and sit for the exam when I see the question I remember exactly where the teacher said the answer so I had a very sharp memory thanks to my mom keeping away all the junk you see ah uh, so they call bright I don't know bright or dark but uh, <laughs> but my mom's decisions contributed to that because she protected us from the junk from the gossip from all the unnecessary emotions because when you watch something without you realizing you're arousing your system depending on what you think about what you're seeing the hormones will come you will get emotions yes and even watching a ad where it looks very innocent but your nerves have to work so hard within that few seconds to understand what the message is yes so so much energy is being taken and 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 so much stress on the brain so we need to teach our kids there is so much research now to show how the games are really bad for you it's like they are saying now the playing the games the the pathways that uh, gets activated is like when you are on cocaine so it's the same addiction that's coming as for cocaine so this is why they need to build now in america they already have done it in australia now they have to build rehabilitation centers for the kids who are addicted to the games they have to be rehabilitated for few months in that center so this is what we do when we don't understand what the life is about so as buddhist if you understand these things teach your kids and be tough but give the reason to them why you're doing it we are not here to just give them what they like and what they always want to please them that's a problem today because the parents are always in conflict they have problems so to win over the heart of the child we just give what they ask what they like all the time child also knows which one to go to <laughs> and you know it damages them so we have to teach with reason then they will listen i have kids there you know after explain scientifically they don't play games now you know the adult, the, the if they understand they can do it on their own otherwise the parents have to be skillful enough to keep them busy with a good thing with a good project with a useful thing that is what our parents did we went on volunteering we went on helping mom and dad at home you know in the garden so many things for us to do so today the kids don't do anything of that just only play 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 waste of time waste of money how many fights are there now uh, apparently they have to spend money so there was a recent incident in my place because the mom rang me about 12 o'clock in the midnight and i'm like yes uh, why uh, I, i thought it was really like a suicidal th- some someone suicide or something like that but she started crying and said you know i took the phone and i smashed it in the ground because you know look what he has done i keep telling him not to do it but i have given the money to pay the tuition fees to the uni and he has used it to get 
to buy the games, thousands of dollars. So this is an addiction. You see, that's an addiction. So we have to understand this, the extent of this, where it will end up. If children can end up in the jail. You know, if they need money, they will try to get in the good way, if not. So we, we have to explain to them, we have to show them, teach them, and then you all can, because you're Buddhist, and you know they all do it to find happiness. But this is in the wrong way. You can find happiness in the wrong way, by pursuing your sensual pleasures, by um, developing ill will, hatred, by developing cruelty, Doing all these things also, you get short-term, temporary pleasures, all these hormonal, you know, pleasures. But they all have very damaging side effects. This is why Buddha said, don't pursue happiness in this way. That's a wrong way to find happiness. The right way to find happiness is giving up these wrong things. Renouncing this, going after the pleasing, the senses, developing not ill will or the hatred, but developing loving kindness, friendliness, developing compassion. That activates the parasympathetic and it will bring a lot more relaxation and peace and happiness to the system for free. Hmm. And you practice it more and more, this selfless way of living. You can get into jhanas, you can get enlightened too. <laughs> so we need to learn to practice in the proper way. So we have to teach our kids to do the right things, the good things, useful things, practice dasaparamita, and get happiness from doing good things. Now they don't have any avenues. That's a problem, because we have let them settle into this rubbish quality happiness. And we have given them, the, who bought the phone, who gave the computer? Adults, the parents. So you all have to reverse it now but with loving kind way, not with fighting. <laughs> sadhu, sadhu. Thank you. Thank you, Arya. Sadhu, thank you. Thank you very so much, Venerable. Yeah. Thank you very much, Arya. Now let us uh, say three resounding sadhus for the very powerful and insightful talk by Arya. Sadhu, sadhu, sadhu. And before we end the session, we would like to invite Arya to kindly lead us in the sharing of merit. <coughs> okay. So I hope that you all understood something and uh, when we hear the truth, again in our body, in the nervous system, in the brain, there are receptors that we are very sensitive to the truths. So when we hear a real truth, the body goes into the relaxed mode and we get peace and also we find happiness. So I hope that by sitting here for a few hours, that you are not stressed, <laughs> you are not really unhappy, but by the power of that truth, hearing that truth, I hope you all relaxed and calm and happy and we have produced a lot of good positive energy, that is what we call the merits. So I be believe that this is a very meritorious deed to do, that sharing of the Dhamma, listening to the Dhamma, developing our understanding to deeper levels. So we did all that, so I'm sure that we all have generated good positive merits. So now we can share this merits, this energy, with unseeing beings, with the devas, with the angels, with the departed friends and the relatives, and with all living beings, whoever can, partake in this. So let's share these merits with the divine beings, with the Samya Drishtika Devi Devatown and also uh, any angel that would appreciate in these good merits. Let us share the merits with them and also let us share these merits with all the departed relatives and uh, friends, including our uh, beloved teacher, Venerable um, Dr. K. Sri Dhammananda Thero, and also any other people who have contributed so much to BGF and to the propagation of the uh, Buddha Dhamma, the Sasana in here. Let's share the merits with them. 
and also with all beings whoever can benefit from this may all living beings benefit from these merits and may they find happiness in wherever they are may they find peace and may they if they already have the happiness may their happiness increase and may they rejoice in their happiness and uh, one fine day may they all be able to penetrate into this dhamma the four noble truths and uh, get enlightened and find freedom from all kinds of suffering and attain the supreme bliss of nibbana so keeping this in mind let's share the merits with all beings and with the devas and with the departed friends and the relatives let's start it with ettavata chammehi gatha ettavata chammehi sabdam punya sampadang sabbe deva anumodantu sabbe bhuta anumodantu sabbe satta anumodantu sabba sampatti siddhiya akasaccha ca bhummatta deva naga mahittika punyantang anumoditva chiran rakkantu loka sasanang chiran rakkantu desanang chiran rakkantu mam paranti idam me nyati nang hotu sukita hontu nyatayo idam me nyati nang hotu sukita hontu nyatayo idam me nyati nang hotu sukita hontu nyatayo also let's make the aspiration that may all the merits that we generated today help uh, help us to bring causes and conditions for us to not to associate with the wicked and the foolish but to associate with the wise and the good until we attain nibbana keeping that aspiration let's chant imina punya kammena mame bala samagamo satan samagamo hotu yava nibbana pattiya also let's aspire for the highest bliss of nibbana in this very life idam me punyam asavakya vahan hotu sab dukha pamujjatu okay i would like to share the merits with uh, all of you uh, uh, with the bgf uh, committee with uh, the ones who organize this um dam sharing with our uh, beloved sister and also with all the volunteers and with all the supporters and all, all of you who came tonight and even with the workers so whoever is supporting this center and whoever is supporting the dhamma to flourish and also your parents your teachers your loved ones your partners your siblings your children your grandchildren and your re- uh, relatives and your friends so may all of you find good health and long life and may all of you also find Uh, victory in all the good and endeav- endeavor that you uh, aspire into whether it's the noble education whether it's your noble uh, vocation or the job or your noble aspirations may they all come true and one fine day may you be able to penetrate into the four noble truths and be able to understand it and be able to live by that and experience the bliss of nibbana in this very life or as soon as possible so wish all of you to find freedom from suffering and to attain nibbana as soon as possible may you all be well comfortable peaceful and happy अभिवादन शीलिस निचांगुदापचायनो चारो धम वर्दंती आयुर्नो सुखंबल आयुरारोग्य संपत्ति सग संपत्ति में वो निभान संपत्ति इमिनाते समेजतु मैं यू ऑल बी वेल एंड हैप्पी even though any is not here i would like to share merits mm-hmm. with sister any for coordinating and organizing this with you 
and uh, for being my kapya and being here, bringing me here, taking me there and dedicating her life, uh, sacrificing her everything for this week with, to be with me. So I also want to make a special thank to her and for all of you for coming and looking after us. May you all be well and happy and the president is there so we wish you all the luck and good luck and strength and courage to continue this good work and spread the Dhamma and help many to find freedom from suffering. May you be well and happy. Sadhu, sadhu, sadhu. sadhu, sadhu. And we also wish Venerable good health and all the fav favorable causes and conditions to develop your Samadhi and your Panya to the highest level and also to um, continue your selfless service for the benefit of many beings. Sadhu, sadhu, sadhu. 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 Let's um, pay respect to Venerable.